Welcome to Digital Asset News, take a top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets, and I'll break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, fascinating stuff. First up, Filecoin token, which was just listed this morning, sees a almost 300% increase in a day as Gemini Kraken announced the listing. Now we're gonna take a look at what happened in a very short amount of time, and it's going to blow your mind also. Next up, Polkadot's tokenized Bitcoin wants to bring DeFi beyond Ethereum. And I need to take a look at exactly what was wrapped Bitcoin and what it could potentially be and do. Next up, Bitcoin is getting two major improvements in historic code update. And if you know anything about Bitcoin, it rarely does this. So this is kind of like a big milestone. And finally, how much Bitcoin does it take to break into the 1% club? And we're gonna look at different theories about what it could be. Some people say it's 0.28, some people say it's up to 15, and why I'm gonna tell you, they're all wrong. But before we get into that, let's take a look at what's going on with the market. So today, it is Thursday, October 15th, almost 1 p.m. Texas time. And what do we got? Well, Bitcoin is almost at 11.5, so not too bad at 1.6%. It's up though, seven and a half almost, or more than that, for the seven day period. So I'll take those numbers. Ethereum, 377. I'm hoping to see a breakthrough at 400, but we will see. However, it is up 10% for the week, so I'll take that W. Uh, Tether's Tether, XRP, watch out, 0.2%. Bitcoin Cash, 3.7% up. And remember, Bitcoin Cash is going to do a hard fork pretty soon. I think it's November. Uh, so you could potentially have a, a big little windfall in your hands. But uh, just be aware that a lot of the things that have forked off of Bitcoin uh, didn't do so hot. So this, again, is a fork of a fork. Uh, if I had to put money on, on anything, it would probably just be Bitcoin Cash. Binance Coin up 2.7, which is great. Congratulations to all you big Binance Coin holders. Chainlink up 20% for the week and only 0.8 for today. But hey, I'll take that win again. Polkadot, Cardano, Litecoin, Bitcoin SV, everything's up. This is a pretty good day. Not that it's up massively, but just a little bit of a stride and we will take it. And what's up big time? Uh, Filecoin. Filecoin is up 101%. And if you notice, it's in a 24 hour time frame. And then of course the seven day, there's nothing there because this is the first couple hours it's actually been listed and it's sitting at around 60 bucks right now as we see it so let's break into the top story because this to me is fascinating actually before we get into that, that file coin i want to share with you uh this video it was fantastic it was from cj uh he had shared this and he's over there at market rebellion and it's it's actually uh peter lynch and he's talking about when do you sell now obviously he's not talking about uh, cryptocurrencies but it's sage advice and it's interesting to see that uh you know one of the big players uh, was wrong multiple, multiple times and uh, really goes and talks about, hey, just be an investor. So take a listen. Funny in the stock, all you can lose is 100%. I've done that. And your great mistakes is selling a good company and that doubles, then it triples and quadruples because you make a lot of mistakes. And so it's ones that go up tenfold. I call them the 10 baggers. So some of my mistakes are saying, oh my God, this stock is too high. And I was wrong. And you had to figure out what inning am I in this baseball game? I sold Toys R Us way too early. It went up 20 fold after I sold. I did the same thing at Home Depot. Those are probably my two greatest mistakes ever made. When should you sell? Well, you ought to find out why you bought a stock. If you're saying it's a cyclical company and they're doing poorly and they're doing awful, you wait till things are getting better and they're doing terrific and then you sell it. But with a growth company, you have to say, Walmart's case, 10 years after they went public, you could have bought the stock and made 500 times your money. You say, still are only in 15% of the United States. And you could, they could say, why can't they go to 17? Why can't they go to 19? Why can't they go to 23? So for the next four decades, they went around the country. So you have to say to yourself, in this stock, I have a 10-year story, a 20-year story. I'll be able to write that down and follow that. That's what I do with the company. And that's your decision. That's how you sell it. No, I, you still buy a company, and you buy a company to grow. And if it's a textile company or it's an electronics company, a software company, you better understand what they do. And, and if they do well, the stock will do well, no matter what happens to the market. If the Dow Jones today was 1,000 or 500, you would have made a lot of money in McDonald's. You would have made a lot of money in Johnson Johnson. You would have made a lot of money in Gillette. These companies' earnings have gone up a lot the last 30 years. And if the market was 50,000, you would have lost money in Burlington Industries. I recommended that in 1969. I think it's, I think it's gone from 34 to 2 with no stock splits. These earnings have been terrible. Well, your modesty actually makes an important point, which is people with the best batting averages in the world don't bat 1,000. I sometimes get angry mail, particularly in bear markets, saying so-and-so recommended such and such, and it went down. Yeah. Well, uh, how often did you come up with a clinker? Well, this, this is a funny business. You don't have to be right even five times out of ten. If the times you're right, you make a double and triple, it offsets all those times you lose 20 or 30%. So when you buy a stock, you say to yourself, how much can I lose and how much can I make? And you ought to be able to make a lot. So again, the investments that you make, are they 
symmetrical or asymmetrical? I can tell you right now, in my opinion, cryptocurrency digital assets are a vastly asymmetrical investment. The downside is, yeah, you could lose a lot of your money, uh, but the upside is tremendous. So those are just my thoughts. Now let's uh, go back to the big article. So what's going on? There's a thing called File and it's blowing up. So here's what we got. Filecoin is basically a distributed storage network based on a blockchain mechanism. Unlike proof of work, Filecoin leverages proof of storage itself. In short, the miner's power is in the consensus protocol is proportional to the amount of storage it provides. And you really gotta think about, well, what does it do? What is this? What is the whole purpose of this? And it was kind of questioned by crypto personality John Carvalho. I don't know who that is. He asked if uh, anyone could articulate the need for the token for the purpose of cloud storage. And it's a good point. Like, I mean, if there's cloud storage, there's cloud storage everywhere, right? Uh, Amazon Web Services, Amazon does that. Android services for your phone, uh, the iPhone as well, and the iCloud. I mean, every place has cloud storage, so why we need this? Well, think about it this way. Where do they store this information? Well, it's on servers, and it's in these huge warehouses where they have to either buy the space or rent the space. Then the servers themselves, uh, which they have to also purchase, which will run down because that's massive overhead. You can make a lot of money, I'm sure, and but uh, it's kind of, if you really look at it, kind of inefficient. But what if you could use the resources that are in everybody's computers or everybody's phones or wherever else it is? And this is how I see it. If you're able to use unused storage, so people can store their pictures and data and things like that. Uh, that seems like a better proposition and probably a cheaper way to do things than by having a centralized server, which is super high cost. So that's how I see Filecoin. And I have to say that Filecoin sounds super boring, but uh, today it was anything but. But going back in history, Filecoin event marks one of the most highly anticipated launches in the industry. And rather than waiting for the network and its token to go live, several exchanges hopped on to list the coin, which is kind of funny how some of these exchanges, they're really staunch, like, well, we can't list this one because it doesn't have a mainnet. Well, <laughs> didn't seem to matter here because even for the launch of the mainnet, Filecoin noted an increase of a whopping 270%. Over the last 24 hours, according to Coin Market Cap, or as I call it, Binance Cap, because that's who owns it. At the time of writing, the token was priced at 110 bucks, and it held a market cap of about 24 hours of trading volume. So, what really is going on can be just summed up in this chart. <laughs> Look at this nonsense. So, trading went live at 8:30 Eastern time. Uh, looks like it started off at around somewhere around 30 bucks. Okay, so when you get in there. I mean, you could have just got in early, like, hey, here it is, you know, here's my 30 bucks. And then you see this like, oh, 31, it's going up. And then boom, it goes down. 28, I'm losing, I got to sell. And then of course, what happens? Wa -da -da, da -da -da -da, $97. And then what happens? 94, not too bad. And then it hits this big peak. And at this point, this is where everybody uh, kind of goes wrong sometimes. Uh, they go, wow, uh, it started off here. I got in here. I'm going to 105. It's never going down. I'm the best trader of all time. I'm a super genius. Everybody look at me. <laughs> that's, and here's the thing. That's exactly what I thought in 2017 during the parabolic bull run. And uh, look how that turned out. So in 2018, everything crashed down. It's the same thing here. And if you ever meet a person who says, I can time the top, run away because they are full of it. And, and this is a, is a pretty good case. So you have 105. I'm hoping people sold. And it looks like a lot of people did because this is exactly what happened. 95, 86, 84, 72, 68, 63, and down we go to 55, 81. However, you have to understand, I mean, even if you're at 30, I mean, what is that? That's like, uh, you know, 50% gain or somewhere around there, 60%. You're still up pretty well. Where will it actually end up uh, at the end of the day? Who knows? But the big thing is don't chase shiny objects as much as you can. Look at the team Look at what it does. Do you believe in the project? Do you believe it's going to be there for a long time? Now you can trade. And I'm sure this was pretty fun if you did it. You know, just like, hey, I'm going to time it, time it, and nah, whatever you want to do. But I don't really like to do that too much. A lot of stress for me. I got other stuff going on. So I just invest. I'm not going to invest in, in, in Filecoin per se, but I just thought it was an interesting uh, example of uh, how things can go a little bit crazy in the crypto world. And this isn't the first and it's not the last. But let me know what you think in the comments section and uh, let's move on. Next up, Polkadot's tokenized Bitcoin wants to bring DeFi beyond Ethereum. So what is this? Well, this will bring Bitcoin's liquidity to DeFi applications on Polkadot and its network of parachains. When we think of DeFi, 
mostly it's all built on Ethereum ERC20 tokens, and Bitcoin can't do that. They can't just go from Bitcoin or you know on the Bitcoin network over to the Ethereum network. It does not work like that unless you wrap it. So Polkadot introduces tokenized Bitcoin blockchain teams are working to replicate the grand success of tokenized Bitcoin products like wrapped Bitcoin. So we have to take a step back and we want to bring everybody up to speed. So what is wrapped Bitcoin? So this was an old article, just so you know, on January 31st, 2019. This is not new, but it just goes to explain what exactly uh, wrapped Bitcoin is. So wrapped Bitcoin, uh, launch on Ethereum, allows users to make Bitcoin-based transactions on a different blockchain. Wrap Bitcoin officially became a tradable ERC20 asset on Wednesday evening as a Bitcoin-based derivative token. Wrap Bitcoin is minted when actual Bitcoin is deposited with a custodian. And that's the big thing. It's with a custodian, a centralized figure, person, entity, conglomerate, something, a custodian on a one-to-one -one ratio. So you give over some Bitcoin, they give you some wrap Bitcoin and it's wrapped in ERC20 token. This allows traders... And of course, this is the question, why? Why? What is the point? This allows traders to effectively use Bitcoin's value on Ethereum and its dApps, for example, on a, on a decentralized exchange, like a Uniswap, like a simple swap, like something like that. So I always think is like, what's the point? I mean, couldn't you just uh, take your Bitcoin and then sell it uh, for Ethereum, then take that Ethereum and then transfer it over to your wallet and then use that in your in the decentralized exchange. You can, or you can just do uh, a wrapped Bitcoin, as they, as they call it. So there are some, there's a little bit of a benefit uh, here and there. And of course, what would be great now is if we are able to do that on Polkadot, because Polkadot, you're not wrapping it into an ERC-20 token, it's in the Polkadot. And or the Polkadot chain or the Polkadot token. What's great about that is Polkadot doesn't just deal with ERC-20. It is interoperability across a broad spectrum of blockchain. So you're not just stuck with uh, going to the Ethereum, which a lot of things are built on Ethereum, let's be honest, but you have a lot more options. And that's the big thing. So a cross-chain bridge will onboard the Bitcoin's liquidity to Polkadot's ecosystem after the Bitcoin parachain goes live in Q1 2021. And let me just tell you this. That's amazing that they're able to say, hey, we we have a, we, this is what we want to do. This is our project. And we're going to get it done in like four or five months because, you know, in March, that's the end of Q1. So if they get it done before then, that's amazing. Think about any projects out there that are just really lagging behind. And these guys are like, hey, we're going to do this uh, in like four months. No problem. Users will be able to lock their Bitcoin and issue Polka BTC, which is one-to-one -one backed. Similarly, to redeem their Bitcoin, users will have to burn Polka BTC on the BTC parachain. So to issue it, you go from Bitcoin to this wrapped Bitcoin. You can do whatever you want to, but then to redeem it, get your Bitcoin back, you got to burn it. Yeah, destroy the Bitcoin back token. So interesting concept. So what's the advantage? Well, the advantage is Bitcoin and Polkadot is that the network is highly interoperable. We just talked about. This means that Bitcoin can do more by interacting with multiple blockchains all at once. This means that DeFi and Polka BTC could spread quickly beyond just the Ethereum ecosystem. So that is the uh, the whole big thing. And just as a recap, I want to go over one thing. What is Polkadot? And this is from Polkadot.network, just what everything is. And why is it so great? So Polkadot's a next generation blockchain. Just know that. And the reason why I invested into this and I believe into it is mostly because of Dr. Gavin Wood, who was one of the founders of Ethereum or the Ethereum Mafia, as I like to call it. Uh, this guy's already done it one time and he's got a great idea. And he was essentially the CTO, the chief technical person, along with Vitalik and uh, a couple other people. But he was the one that really made it, made it go. And I read this book. It is fantastic. If you got an opportunity, pick it up. It's called The Infinite Machine. And it goes over the history of how Ethereum was created. Uh, the different bumps and obstacles along the way and how they got it actually to market. And it was fascinating. And the information about there about Dr. Wood or Gavin it was essentially why I invested in a Polkadot because of that book. Anyhow, what does Polkadot do? Well, it scales easily. Blockchains in isolation can only process a limited amount of traffic. Polkadot is a sharded <laughs> multi-chain network, meaning you can process many transactions on several chains in parallel, eliminating the bottlenecks that occurred on legacy networks, Bitcoin, that process transactions one by one. And Ethereum 1.0 is one of those as well. So 
that's big for scaling. And as we start to build up, uh, we need to have those high transactions per second, just like what Visa has. I mean, 150,000 is pretty darn good that, that Visa can produce, as opposed to Ethereum's 17 to 45 and Bitcoin 6 to 10. So we need that to happen. And then it goes over how to, you know, specialize and work together and self cover and all that stuff. But to me, that's the big one. Uh, it's all interoperability and it's going to make everything a little bit smoother, a little bit better, and a little bit faster. So let me know what you think in the comments section. Let's move on. Next up, Bitcoin's getting two major improvements in code. That's big because it rarely happens. So what's going on? The much awaited Schnorr and Taproot proposals, first of all, a horrible name, Schnorr, were implemented to Bitcoin Core earlier today, as per history, available on GitHub to check it out. When activated, they will bring about better transactional capabilities, that's huge, to Bitcoin while increasing the network's privacy features. So that's enormous. We're gonna have better transaction and more privacy features on Bitcoin. Uh, who doesn't want that? I've been uh, a big negative Nelly about the ability of Bitcoin to be an actual currency uh, because I always talk about in 2017 what happened uh, when people started to use it more and more and more. The fees were became outrageous and the transaction times uh, were just ridiculously uh, slow. And sometimes it would take days to move Bitcoin. That's not what it was developed for. So if this happens, I will be... Uh, eating some crow <laughs> if this can actually happen, but it's an exciting time, hopefully it does. So as far as testing, they've undergone one month of testing, hopefully they do months, but whatever. The Taproot proposal alone saw over 150 developers reviewing the code. And that's one of the big things about, about Bitcoin, it moves slow. It moves slow because they're very cautious. And there's two ways of thinking about it. Be cautious and be perfect and then release it. Cardano does the same type of thing. Or just start building, throw it out there and see what breaks. And that's kind of the theory behind Yearn and Wi-Fi and uh, Hay, the uh, developer or the uh, founder that did that. They just say, hey, uh, is like, I'm just going to, I'm not going to do a test net. I'm just going to start building, throw it out there and whatever breaks, I'll fix it later. And it, it keeps breaking. Of course, he fixes it. The problem is it gets hacked and people lose money. And that's a big thing. So there's advantages and disadvantages for both ways of doing it. But uh, I mean, that's above my pay grade. So I kind of do like this um, conservative approach a little bit more because I'm a little bit more uh, on that side. But uh, everybody's got their own opinion. Anyhow. Moving down, Schnorr is an alternative to Bitcoin's current multi-signature wallet mechanism, which, as the name suggests, uses multiple private keys to facilitate a transaction from a Bitcoin wallet. However, the Schnorr update combines multiple keys to a single key when a user transacts using Schnorr. This significantly reduces the data size of multi-sig payments and helps decongest the network. So essentially they kind of go in reverse, it sounds like to me, but it does reduce the conge congestion. Maybe the TPS or transactions per second will actually be increased, and that's good news, I suppose. Taproot takes Schnorr further by introducing a new transaction output version and new ways for users to define conditions for when they spend Bitcoin, which one advantage that of even following users under very certain conditions they can regain their lost coins. Let me say that again. Under very certain conditions, you can regain access to the lost coins. And this is huge because if you look at how much Bitcoin, this is all debatable, uh, how much has actually been lost. In 2010, 11, 12, people were throwing away their computers with Bitcoin on it because they're like, it's only like worth pennies, you know? So why would I keep it around? And uh, PCs sometimes break down and it's easier to throw them away and not transfer anything. So we've probably lost who knows, two to four million, six million on the high end, if you believe some studies. And we're going to go over that in the uh, next article about who, about the uh, 1% to be a Bitcoiner. But um, I think this is enormous because this is one of those barriers to entry that we talk about as far as people getting into cryptocurrency digital assets, which is, hey, if I send it to the wrong person or the wrong address or just screw up, it's gone, right? I can't call customer service like I can with my bank. Yep, that's right. So if you screw up, uh, it's gone. And that's one of those things about becoming your own bank. It's a pain. It is a little bit of a pain because we rely on the banks to do all these different types of things. But there are the advantages of being your own bank and being in charge of everything and not getting screwed over by the big bankers. And this is just one of those problems. So I think it's interesting that this is going to, they're going to allow to access lost coins. I don't know how it's going to work. We'll see how it all gets rolled out. But again, this is a, it's a pretty big deal because there's very rare times when Bitcoin gets any upgrade or any type of new code because it takes so long to do things. So we'll see how it all works out. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let's move on to our last article. Last up, 
How much take to be in the 1% club? I always love these stories when I first got in because I'm like, I want to be there. I want to get that. And uh, over time, it's morphed into like these wildly ranging numbers between, you know, from now in this article, it talks about 0 0.28 to 15 Bitcoin, which I think is ridiculous. But um, here's what it all says. So 1% club is when someone's in the top 1% of Bitcoin holders. Got it. So there's the first analogy or analysis was by Jake Levison, and this is in 2002, an analyst for BlockWorks Group. He said, if you own 0.28 Bitcoin, you're statistically guaranteed to be in the richest 1% of the world in Bitcoin terms. And the problem with that, and I'll tell you, tell you why, is because he took the total amount that would ever be uh, mined as far as Bitcoin and said 21 million divided by the total population, which was around seven and a half billion at that point, and you'd get 0 0.28. Well, there's some flaws there. First of all, um, to get all the Bitcoin mined, it's going to be in, in the year 2140. So I'll be dead. I don't really care. And the second thing is, is that that assumes that everybody is going to have their hands on Bitcoin. That's not going to happen. Okay. Seven and a half billion people. Sorry. So 0 0.28 is on the lowest side and i don't think that's even remotely possible but it could be wrong and also of course what we just talked about in the last article uh where we said that you know, you know between two and six million bitcoin is just gone and lost forever and i really wish that would be uh reflected in the price uh for these different market caps like coin gecko I, I don't know if they really take that into account because i mean it i just don't see how it's that low so actually let me go i want to see something on coin gecko there's a so if you click on bitcoin or any any cryptocurrency whatever else they will talk about, yeah, right here, circulating supply, 18.5 million. Well, that's not happening. I'm telling you that right now. Max supply is 21 million. So 18 and a half million, in reality, I think it's more like 15 and a half, 15 million, somewhere around there. And that would drastically affect the price right now. But they can't quantify that, so eh, whatever. Anyhow, and then here's the high end. 15 Bitcoin is the magic figure by Blocklink. This conclusion uh, disregards wallet and address data and assumes no lost Bitcoin again, which is dumb. And they said 15 million. Okay, so that's one part. And then also you have to remember that uh, there are multiple Bitcoin addresses. Like I personally own at least 10. Uh, they're in my various uh, nano ledgers. They're on my various uh, exchanges that I use. So on all those different addresses, I mean, it's, it's all mine. If you add them all up, I mean, I got more than one, but, you know, a lot of them aren't that much, you know, 0 0.1. So if you have like 10 different addresses, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, you got one Bitcoin. But it just looks like, you know, this address is, this address XYZ, blah, 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 only has 0 0.1. And that's not how it is. It's just one person has a ton of different addresses, and it's hard to uh, quantify that. And, you know, moving down, this was the, the latest one. This is from BitInfo chart. And what it comes down to is this. It says, here's the balance of Bitcoin. Here's the how many addresses, the percent of addresses total, and the coins. So if you look at what could be the 1%, um, here's 2%. That's not bad. And the balances of those addresses, and there are 655,744 addresses that have between 1 and 10. It's about 2% people. So between somewhere between 1 and 10 is probably the sweet spot. I have to think really in, in realistic terms, I think it's got to be somewhere between one and two. If you got one and two, between one and two Bitcoin, first, I mean, maybe you're not in the 1% or the 0.1% or whatever else it is, but it's pretty good as time goes on, especially with what's going to happen, everything that we've seen over the last couple of months. I mean, institutions are pretty much fumbling in. Uh, we've talked about banks getting into the, into the fray. We've talked about big institutional players. So I think if you got one and two, that's your, your way ahead of everybody else out there, especially right now, especially right now. And of course, this chart uh, doesn't take to, to account uh, multiple wallets, so that's also a problem. But uh, yeah, if you got anywhere between one and two, I mean, you are way ahead of the rest of the population uh, as far as globally. So let me know what you think in the comments section. And that is it for today's video. If you're looking at an alternative to Coinbase or whatever exchanges you have, I've got the exchange of wallet fees. It's just a breakdown of all the different fees and all the different uh, interests that you can you can gain uh, for wherever you put your cryptocurrency. Uh, my one, two, three punch, uh, Kraken. 
Celsius and Voyager. I like Celsius because I have, uh, first of all, the fees. Well, I don't really buy anything. I, I buy everything from Voyager. But then the fees for uh, Celsius are the actual interest rate that I get. I have over 30%. Now it's over 30% of my portfolio on the Celsius network, the Celsius platform. And the interest rate's pretty good. I love them. So, uh, so far, uh, doing pretty good. But you can look at everything. I got Celsius, Voyager. Uh, Gemini, Gemini Pro, Binance, Uphold, Abra, Simple Swap, Uniswap, uh, Cash App. I don't really like them. eToro, don't recommend them, and Crypto.com. So uh, take a look at that. And of course, there's uh, if you sign up, uh, use the affiliate link. Uh, you don't have to. You can go right to the uh, exchange or wallet and download it or, or sign up. But if you use the links, it gives you between $10 and $25 uh, just for signing up. And uh, that is it. So thanks again for sticking with me. If you like those types of videos, I mean, two more is going to pop up on your left and right. Don't know because uh, YouTube does all that stuff. And uh, that's all we got. So thanks again. See you on the next.